I'm Paul Bennett at Shoestring Shipyard here in Millbridge, Maine. We're located along Maine's Bowl Coast, not very far from the U.S. Canadian border. This week, I'm making my own anchor, not just an anchor, but a Rockner or Mantis clone, which is uh, the newer style wedge type anchors. If you've priced them lately, uh, the size that I would probably choose for my new 18 foot sailboat is we probably retails with shipping somewhere in the vicinity of around $600 or so. So I decided I'm going to clone one and come very close to what they make, only using mild steel. I've got this 42 inch piece of 3 8 inch flat bar. From my metric friends, that's about 9 millimeters thick. It's about a little over 50 millimeters wide. This plate I bought is 18 inches square by 3 eighths of an inch or 9 millimeters thick. For my metric friend, I think it's somewhere around 450, 455 millimeters. If you have looked at the Rockner or Mantis uh, wedge style anchors, they basically have a triangle, a wedge, and then they have a couple of ears that come up a little bit of an angle. I'm going to cut this plate like this. I'm going to take these cutoff pieces, turn them around, reverse them, and put them at a little bit of an angle. And then for the stem of the anchor coming up, I'm going to fabricate that from this flat bar. What I have to do first is I have to remove the mill scale. And the only reason I'm removing this mill scale is because once I get this anchor finished and it's all welded up, I want to give it a good coat, a couple of coats of a zinc chromate primer. This steel, all total, it cost me about $45. If I found, if I could find a used Mantis or Rockner of the size I want in style, it would still cost me somewhere around $300 or more plus shipping. I uh, just wanted to bring up a point, and that is. Although I'm fabricating this myself, I'm well aware of the risk involved and the chances I'm taking in fabricating my own anchor. Uh, throughout my years as a marine engineer and naval architect and doing many years of fabrication and working in the ship repair business, I have a good idea of how this has to proceed and what I'm doing. I have a good idea of how the Ellis is going to work. However, I can't recommend it to you, and I, I don't, as a matter of fact, don't recommend that you do this yourself. I'm just uh, showing you what I do, and the risk involved in having this not hold or break or whatever. I understand those risks. I'm doing this myself. Nobody else is responsible but me for my boat, my anchor, and I'm willing to accept those risks. So. Please don't take it upon yourself to do this sort of thing if you don't have that kind of experience or the capability and you don't understand what's going on. Uh, I just, uh, I hope you don't do that. This is really for entertainment to show you what I'm doing. As you can see behind me, and all around. Even though it's officially spring, this is Maine, and of course we had a snowstorm last night. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find the uh, the center of this plate. Should be at about nine inches, right there. And I don't want to come to a perfect point when I do this triangular shape, so I'm coming out a little bit, maybe uh, 3 16 maybe something like that on each side of center line. In other words, maybe about 9 millimeters wide. And then I'm just going to go 
from where I made my marks to each corner. here. So now I have a cut line on each side. It's my cut lines and I just have to cut these two pieces off leaving me with a triangle that has a slightly blunt tip and you'll see where that's going a little bit later. I'm still working on my anchor. I tacked it together, put a few root wells, you know, in the joints. I haven't finished doing that yet. I don't want to put on, I don't want to put too much heat. I have it concentrated in any one area because I don't want the, uh, the anchor to warp and twist. The metal will deflect if I do that. I have all the parts of my anchor cut out to their proper shapes and sizes. This is basically how this is going to go. I turn this around like so. And then we're going to put a bit of an angle on it like this. And then these components here like so. Uh, you get the idea. That, that builds up this goes on there, these wings up here like that. Before I start welding though, what I have to do is I have to prep these parts for welding by grinding a bevel along the edges of the, the mating edges here of the different parts where they're going to go together. I have to have a bit of a bevel, and then I'll set them into place and I can tack them up.
boy, that's a heavy son of a gun. Oh, this thing must weigh about 50 pounds, pretty close to it. That ought to hold the boat in place. Now I just have to do my finish wells along the seams on both sides. Once I get that finished up and I clean up the wells, get a nice finish pass on them. And then it's just a matter of uh, getting a few coats of primer and paint on it. Now the only thing left to do for this to be completed, because the welding on the anchor itself is done, is take this 5 8 inch round bar and I have to bend it into a, a half moon shape circle, half circle. It's going to bend around like this. That's going to give me my rollover bar. So if the anchor lands somehow upside down, it'll roll over when you're setting the anchor and then get a bite dig in. That's what these are intended for. I'm going to use my homemade forge which I'll show you in a moment. The problem is, is with this uh, coronavirus lockdown thing the uh, the place that supplies my coal that I use in my forge is shut down and I need some more coal. I thought I had some somewhere and apparently I must have used it this job I'm going to set aside. I'm going to finish it up with the exception of this. I'm going to go ahead and prime it and paint it because the only place it's going to get welded is on each ear on each side here and I've already ground it flat so I have a place to weld to so when the time comes I can just grind off the affected area that's going to be welded and go ahead and then touch it up with the with the paint and everything. So right now I'm starting out with, I'm applying uh, this primer. I did want to use the zinc chromate primer, but it's just, it's, it's expensive because it's considered hazmat. They charge you quite a bit extra for shipping if you do buy it. And I have to buy it in a quantity way above and beyond what I really need just for this anchor. I'm going to break from here now and I'll show you what my forge looks like. This is my homemade forge and I've had it for quite a few years and I made this uh, long before I started making YouTube videos so I don't have a, a build video on it. Basically I used the brake drum from a big truck, a front brake drum, that was given to me by a local uh, garage. I lined the inside of the drum with a lot of fire brick and then I mixed uh, some fire clay with a little bit of Portland cement and some sand, uh, all equal parts. This here isn't the original liner. I had to reline it because it only lasts for a little while. It's had a lot of heavy use. And then this is just a little bit of a tray. The thing is, you don't want the depth of your, uh, your fire pan or fire area to exceed really two and a half to three inches or so is all you really want. This is for cleaning it out and cleaning ash. And this bar across here is so I can pick the whole thing up. It's pretty heavy. I have to pick it up with a hook uh, attached to a chain with the bucket of my tractor. And then this has a bunch of holes in it for the air to come through. I used a lot of scrap materials that I had kicking around. And what you're looking at underneath, underneath the forges is called the tweer. And what I do is I, I hook up a blower to this inlet pipe here and that provides the forced air up into the, uh, into the fire. And underneath here you'll see this little device here and that's used, I can, I can open this up and dump ash out and I have to free it up though, it's kind of frozen. Uh, this is a little, there it is right there. That keeps the ash from falling out when I'm using it and keeps the air from blowing out the bottom. Then when I need to clean out the ash, I can just open that up. It's just a little counterweight here that helps keep it closed. So it's pretty simple. So if you've ever thought of doing any kind of blacksmith work, 
uh, and you need a forge to heat up your metal, then uh, this is something that's pretty simple to put together. It's, uh, it's not rocket science. I know that some people are going to say, well, if you don't have coal, why don't you just uh, put in some wood, you know, or briquettes or something? Well, I don't have any briquettes, and again, the stores are closed. Uh, as far as wood goes, we have plenty of wood up here in Maine and on our 50-acre uh, family farm. But uh, the problem with wood is that it burns way too fast, and I don't quite achieve the temperature I need in for a long enough period of time for the, to do a project like the one I, I plan on doing. I could use it and get away with it if I was just, if all I had to do was just heat up a little small piece. Well, I just filmed a little mini tour of my uh, my forge with my GoPro, so I'll be blending that in with the uh, with the video, and now I can get back to finishing up my priming. When I do get the coal and I'm able to finish this up, I'll probably throw in a little bit of footage of this finishing it off. And if you've been watching the boat build, then you know you'll see it then. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor?